BioBalance HealthCast episode 162, How Insurance Companies Meddle in Your Healthcare. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Hello and welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This morning, Kathy and I had prepared a conversation that we were going to have about uh, toxins and oxygenation in the aging process. And when we were discussing toxins, we, we discovered that we had a toxic event, which is a different thing that had happened and got us both stirred up. So instead of the conversation we originally intended to have, we're going to have a different one. And it has to do with the way insurance companies operate. Uh, there, there is a general perception among the consuming populace that their insurance companies are sort of uh, caring grandfatherly figures <laughs> that are worried about making sure that they get the best quality health care that they can uh, and providing the services that they need to make them healthy and prolong their life. And Kathy and I are of the opinion that that is not why insurance companies exist it's or how they screen. function. It's a smoke uh, screen so that you believe that so you'll do what they say. We, we believe that insurance companies are about making profit. And one of the ways that they make profit is they deny the provision of services. So when you have a condition or situation mm -hmm. and you send uh, bills into your insurance companies, then they evaluate it according to whatever protocols they use. And fairly often they will say, we don't pay for that. That's experimental. That's outside the norm. That's not in the broad range that we use uh, and find acceptable. And, and an example of that is that for probably the last year, uh, Kathy has been prescribing Armour Thyroid for me because I had a, a low thyroid which was causing my body temperature not to get high enough to make my hormones work the way that they were supposed to work. And your cholesterol went up. And my cholesterol was going up as a result. So I, I was on a blood pressure medicine uh, and I was on a diuretic and I was on a couple of other things. A cholesterol, that a cholesterol and high blood pressure. Other doctors had prescribed to counteract that symptomology. Mm -hmm. Kathy said, if you go back to the beginning and get your thyroid in the active range where it needs to be, you won't need all these medicines. And so my insurance company and I were spending in excess of $200 a month to pay for all of these various medicines that I am now no longer on and haven't been on for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's a, an expense savings that I mm -hmm. think they're not recognizing. But at any rate, the reason we got into this conversation is Yesterday, Kathy, who has no uh, official connection to this insurance company, which is Humana, mm -hmm. uh, at all. I mean, she doesn't have a contract with them. She's not a provider for them. She has, she's a physician who's doing her business with her patients. But I she never gets, get a check from them. They're you not, never get a check from any not, kind. There's no monetary obligation. Connection to them or, or any kind of obligation. Mm -hmm. But she gets a letter from my insurance company, which my insurance company has denied uh, me this drug. They will not pay for it. It's not in their formulary. Uh, or it's not in their protocol for people my age with my condition, whatever that is. But it's approved by the FDA it is to approved. treat thyroid. And so, it's part of standard of care. And it's the cheapest thyroid medicine on the market. Right. So, so for $4 a month. Makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I can get this medicine. And so I pay for it myself. So I figure that's the end of the conversation. They, we sent them the request. They said, no, we don't pay for that. If you choose to do that, you're on your own. So I'm on my own. But now they're going around without speaking to me about it, and they've sent a letter to Kathy that basically says, justify and cease and desist. So <laughs> tell them about the letter that you received. The letter was uh, basically said that I was giving a drug that should not be given to Elderly patients. Elderly men. Elderly, elderly I'm an men. elderly man, according to their, their statistics. It's so sad. <laughs> it's so sad. I mean, when I, I called him to tell him this, and he's like, harumph, harumph. <laughs> yeah. I, was, <laughs> I am not quoting elderly. Quoting Mel Brooks, can I get a yeah. harumph? I was really ticked <laughs> off, first of all, that they called her or, or written right. to her because, again, I'm paying for the medicine, and she has no connection to them. We're not part of Humana in regards to this medicine and this treatment. Or but, me. So, but, I mean, our not. relationship. So they've inserted themselves into this relationship in a way that I find offensive because they not only ask her to justify why she's doing what she's doing, they've instructed her to cease and desist. Stop giving me the medicine. They're not doctors. First of all, yeah. you have to understand that an insurance company has multiple levels. Right. They may have one doctor on staff. Everybody else are 
salespeople, accountants, right. and Clerks. and people who don't have necessarily have any more education than high school, mm -hmm. making phone calls to doctor's office, denying treatment. I don't think anybody realizes that. Be and they take out tons of money out of the healthcare system every year to deny you coverage and deny care. Right. The doctors who have gone through eight to, let's see, neurosurgeons, nine plus four, 13 years of, tr of care, uh, excuse me, of training. Right hard training they had to pay for or they were paid so little they could barely live, they they had to go through this tough training and make it and succeed right. to be doctors and they're being told by somebody who doesn't have any education they can't do it. Well this is by the higher ups. Mm -hmm. They've developed something they call their quality of care that I've never heard of, which is baloney, called the Beers Quality of Care and they say, Dear Dr. Moppin, our records indicate that the patients, and Brett was one of them, listed on the enclosed report received a medication considered high risk when used in patients 65 years of age or older, according to the Beers criteria, which I've never heard of. Please review the enclosed patient reports. So underneath that it says discontinue the medication, if appropriate, or consider an alternative. <laughs> the if appropriate parenthetical. Right. Discontinue the medication, if appropriate. So they've, they say they've implemented a quality program. Mm -hmm. Well, Armour Thyroid was out there and has been used successfully and without problems, as many problems as Synthroid, since the 40s. Mm -hmm. And it is the drug that split the community between DOs and MDs. DOs said, and I'm not a DO, I'm an MD, but my daughter's a DO. DO said, natural is better. Armour Thyroid is natural, natu and it works, so why do we need a synthetic? Mm. Well, and the MD said, oh, we have an, a, a synthetic, we're throwing away all the natural stuff. This was in the 40s and 50s. They divided, they fought over this issue. The two, two types of doctors split. DOs became holistic and became more natural doctors, not naturopaths. They are just like MDs in training and, and the tests they take, they just have a more holistic view. And then the MDs went, oh, we're going synthetic. So they go synthetic. So, so synthetic is Synthroid and Lavoxyl. Well, they want me to change him to a synthetic mm -hmm. that is more expensive, but they'll pay for it. And it won't work as well. Armour Thyroid works much better in most people. Now, mm -hmm. I have to say, I do use Synthroid in some people after I figured out that Armour Thyroid doesn't right. work, or sometimes in young men, Synthroid seems to work a little better, but that's my own choice. And because I'm a doctor, I get to make that choice. That's what I get for all of this hell I've gone through training. And these kind of letters, I get to make the choice of how I treat my patients. Well, and I segue this conversation. I, before we started to talk today, I was telling Kathy about my previous physician who used to give me a prescription for a blood pressure medicine. And she gave me the prescription and I got uh, to the uh, pharmacy to get it filled and the insurance company refused to pay for it. And they said, we, we don't have that particular drug in what's called our formulary. Mm -hmm. uh, they create a, a basket of drugs that they buy in bulk quantity from the production systems, the manufacturing uh, pharmacology. And if it's not in their list, they don't provide it or pay for it. So they sent me back to my physician with instructions to get a different uh, blood pressure medicine, one that was in their list that they had bulk pricing for so that it would be cheaper for them and, so and irrelevant to whether that was the best drug for me. Yeah. And my doctor was upset. She's like, I chose this drug for you because of your unique individual circumstances. And now the insurance company says, we have a one size fits all response to blood pressure medicines and you need to choose from among these three or four. Uh, and, that's, and that's what's going to happen more and more. Well, and with, so her with, response to me was, okay. we, we can change to one of these that they're saying you can use, and we'll see how that works for you, or you can choose the one that I know is best for you, but it's going to cost you $350 a month, well, which most do you people choose can't to take, do, which to most do that. people can't do. That's exactly, I and mean, I couldn't do it. I took the well, other drug. Well, another drug that's, that's common, there's a blood pressure drug called lisinopril. Lisinopril is an excellent blood pressure drug. It's cheap. Mm -hmm. It works, but... In men, it causes ED, so it causes erectile dysfunction. So I have men come to me all the time 
for testosterone. Yeah, their testosterone's low, but they have erectile dysfunction because in they're addition, on they're on lisinopril. Right. It decreases the blood pressure in your pelvis, not just all over, but more in your pelvis than in other places. Mm -hmm. So many blood pressure medications can cause ED. So you're taking Viagra and the blood pressure medicine. Which so, are working against each other, basically. Which, well, they're working with, with each other. One's, yeah, one's decreasing your blood pressure in a, there's different methods and different, different mechanisms, mm -hmm. but one drops your blood pressure, but Viagra also drops your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's why they say you shouldn't, you shouldn't probably do both because right. it might get too low, right. but it does it in a different way. But Viagra dilates the pelvis and brings the blood to the pelvis, right. which helps with erections. So when I have men that come to me and they need testosterone and that will help their erections, but they're not going to be happy if they come back and go, yeah, it's half better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of it's better for about two minutes. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I have to change their blood pressure medicine. The best blood, pr blood pressure medicine for erectile dysfunction is Benicar. Well, we went, we've gone through that with other people, including my husband, and I've, put him, I've changed him to Benicar. Well, Benicar is an expensive drug. And so, but that works, and it doesn't drop his blood pressure. So that's really one of the best But the, but the insurance companies resist. They, they wouldn't pay for it. We paid for it, mm -hmm. and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. But it was worth it. I mean, what are you, you're going to pay for Viagra. <laughs> if your blood pressure medicine is causing your ED, you're going to out of pocket have to pay for Viagra. Right. They, the insurance company doesn't care about that. They don't care that you have to do that. No. That's not their problem because they're well, not because paying for it. Because their money's standing in their pocket. They deny it. Right. So the other, th the other thing, I mean, to me, that's mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure medicine and is should be, that should be discussed with men. If men knew that, they would say, well, what's about the best blood pressure medicine for me? They would be put on it, and they wouldn't have so much need to go on yeah. this. So there's two drugs, I think, that has caused CED, mm -hmm. which because it's not treated by or paid for by insurance companies, they don't really care. Right. One is cholesterol medication because it drops your testosterone. So you go on cholesterol medicine and immediately you start getting ED. That's why so many people have it because so many people are on cholesterol medicine. Interesting. So it decreases your testosterone. But rather than go off your cholesterol medicine and bring testosterone up, which eventually is still going to go down with age, mm -hmm. they, you know, they put you on... Viagra, or I mean, a lot of people don't think this through. A lot of doctors don't think it through. Right. They're listening to the drug company. They're oh, just, and they're everybody to should be on symptoms. cholesterol medicine. They just yeah. think everybody should be on it. Yeah. Well, I probably should have been on it in the past, but once once I got my testosterone back, it made my cholesterol go down. Uh -huh. So I don't need to be on it. Right. So replacing my testosterone helped, but taking that would have made it worse. So I don't know how it could have been worse. However, for men, it's much worse. And most men are on cholesterol medicine. So that's another thing. They say that they don't have cholesterol medicine on this list. They gave me a list of things that should not be given to the elderly. Which, which they, by definition, say is 65. 65 and over, over, which I think is hilarious. One is methyl dopa. It's a beta blocker. And that's something that I take. And I'll have to take the rest of my life because I have a tachycardia, a fast heart rate. So... It's, it is absolutely necessary. There's no replacement for it. Mm -hmm. But they say, what did they say? It causes low blood pressure. Well, yeah, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But you have to figure out the dose. But it decreases my t heart rate. That's the only thing that will do it. Mm -hmm. So what happens when I'm 65? I go off this. Mm -hmm. this, isn't, this is elderly, not men. Right. Elderly. So they don't, and the other things, they don't want you to take methyl testosterone either. Mm. And they don't pay for bioidentical testosterone we've never even you've never even sent in no. a, a request for that no but the the testosterone that we give in general the insurance companies say they'll pay may not for men they never pay for women hardly mm -hmm. ever for women mm -hmm. so even though they say their answer is different for every population right they say, I don't pay for it for women because it's not FDA approved and we don't approve bioidentical in any form. Right. But I give the men bioidentical and half of, they'll usually pay half back to the patient. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Same stuff. Yeah. Just a different sex. It's just a sexual discrimination thing and a way for them to save money. Right. 
So these are the things that are in play when you're in your doctor's office and they're trying to think of something to give you to make you better and to actually make you functional and healthy. These are the things that are happening. In, in your case, it saved you three drugs. Right, and, and the cost of those and the cost for of those are two gone. years now. Yeah. So $200 a month right. times two years, and I'm sure it costs them more than $200 a month, but, mm. but that was your savings. Right. And the insurance company pays a, por a greater portion usually than the patient. So they saved a bunch of money, mm -hmm. and in, in that way, they don't even acknowledge that by well, putting them on one $4 a month drug. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's a broader range issue than the example that we're using in my business, which is mental health counseling. Uh, years ago, in the 80s, when the HMOs were really taken off and trying to regulate cost control factors in mm -hmm. medicine and, and the provision of services, I used to have to send in treatment plans uh, for my, my patients, uh, saying, here's the diagnosis, here's the symptomology, here's the strategy, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, will you approve payment for these services? And then the insurance companies would say, well, uh, we'll give you 10 visits in a two and a half month period. And at the end of that time, write us back and let us know if you need more. And so every mm -hmm. two months, you'd have to reapply for the provision of services for the insurance company to cover it. So that, that's kind of what you just learned to do. But I had an adolescent boy who was in the seventh grade. His parents had gone through a divorce. Shortly after they'd gone through a divorce, his father died. And so he was blaming his mother, but he had to live with his mother. And he was in adolescence, had a very difficult time. And he was very suicidal and depressed. So I saw him for about uh, a year on a weekly basis for his suicidal depression. And his mother changed jobs, and when she changed jobs, her insurance company changed. The new insurance company said, this man is not on our, it's an HMO, I'm not on their service provider list. I don't have a contract with them to provide for their patients. So they said, he cannot see your son. So we wrote letters saying, this kid is suicidal, he's lost his male figure, I have been seeing him, I am helping him both as a male figure who, who supports and cares about him uh, in, a, in that adolescent break, 13, 14, where boys really need mm -hmm. men. Uh, and I'm dealing with the, the suicidality and Your the depression. Your relationship with him as well. And they wrote back and said, we have male service providers on our contract list who are licensed and just as good as this man is. Uh, so, no, you can't see him. He has to switch over. Nobody asked the boy, what is your choice? Mm -hmm. Our credentials, the provider list versus the non-provider list, were exactly the same. The treatment plans, I don't know if they would have been the same or not, but I had the relationship and the history and the credential. Mm -hmm. They said no. And so we said, if you rock this boy's boat and he's already demonstrably suicidal, he may kill himself. You know, let us have six months to transition. Let us have three months to transition and move him towards a new clinician. You know, I certainly don't think I am the end-all, be-all, but no, I think this kid needs a, an adjustment he, process. He also needs consistency. And they said, no, she doesn't, uh, she, she's got to change right now. Uh, so they took him. And that really distressed both of us, but it was an insurance company, it was, it was a cost-saving, quality-saving contract. He could have killed himself. He could have. And, and they said, I said, so you realize with all this communication exchange that we've had, if this boy harms himself, attempts to kill mm -hmm. himself, his mother's going to sue you. And they said, that's okay, we have lawyers too. So they don't care and about the life of the boy. They don't care was, about... No, that wasn't their concern. That wasn't their concern. Their concern was the purity, their contract arrangement with their providers. So it, it, and that was in the 80s. Well, and it was a different insurance company. I want to make clear about that. Uh, it, I had another insurance company <laughs> that called me. I was seeing a woman for, uh, again, depression, mm -hmm. and I'd seen her for a period of time, and I was writing a justification, and the manager of the insurance company, which was a local PPO, called mm -hmm. me and said, do you not understand that this woman has a lifetime cap and that you are using up her lifetime uh, payouts for these mental health services. So you need to stop seeing her so that she can save some in her bank for later in case she has other problems. If she changes insurance, she'll have a different lifetime cap. Well, and my response was, <laughs> I don't work for you. I work for her. She is my patient. I have a responsibility to you. And I don't care about, I'm not asking your permission to treat her. I am giving you information that you can use to make your determination whether you'll pay her for mm -hmm. these services or not. Mm -hmm. But 
I don't have a relationship with you or responsibility to you. I have a responsibility to the, to the patient. So you do whatever you're going to do. I'm going to see her uh, as long as she wants to see me. So the reason I'm telling the story is a couple weeks later, a friend of mine who socially was a friend of this woman I was talking to on the phone, uh, my name came up in the conversation, and, and the woman that ran the PPO said, who is that SOB? He is really arrogant. Who does he think he is? <laughs> well, he thinks he's the doctor and you're not. Yeah. I mean, the deal is, uh, what there, there is, there's, um, I guess I'm going to call it a magic. There should be a magic or a, a non-physical contract between a patient and a doctor. Mm-hmm. And it is part of the healing. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. It's part of the healing. Yes, we use ex nurse extenders. Yes, but you know your doctor's in charge of this. Right. You know that, and you have to have a relationship with the extenders as well. However, the touch, not like that, but the touch. The, <laughs> the touch. The, I mean, the fact that, you know, you can hug your patient. Hmm. That I can. Yeah. I can, I can hug my patients. Right. Um, that I can... Um, you know, I have a an understanding with them that I am going to look for the best treatment. I'm going to look for the most most healthy way to proceed. I am. They know I'm not going to just go. Oh yeah, I'm going to do what the insurance company says. Here, take this. It doesn't work, but you know, I'm not going to do that. And we should be, and your doctor should be fighting for you in a way. But his his or her relationship is only responsible to you. And then you have to understand that the insurance companies put us through hell. That's why I don't take insurance. Mm -hmm. But they put us through hell because they have, all they do is figure we're a, we're a bottomless pit of spending money and they don't really care about right. who, the, who we're spending money for. But the deal is we have to do tests. We have to take care of you. And it takes a lot of technology to do that nowadays, to do it appropriately. That's expensive. But in general, doctors have been paid less and insurance companies have made more money. Right. If we took them out, which is what I'm really an advocate of, we don't need them. We would take out 50 cents on the dollar. They In terms waste of the cost. Yeah. money. And that would be off the plate and patients would get more and they would just have to find doctors they trust. But that's, that would take one visit. You, can, you should be able to tell. Somebody that you want to have take care of you. So I guess at the end of the day, and thank you for allowing us to vent and share some of our experiences with insurance companies, but I, the message is in this period of flux for questions about insurance providers and medical coverage and how the system is evolving, uh, whither should it go, please get involved, please be aware, contact uh, your representatives uh, in, in the government contact your insurance companies, support your physicians, contact get your involved medical board. in saying, you know what, this needs to stop. Because they're practicing medicine without a license. They're, <laughs> and they're interfering. In, in this particular example, I am not asking them to pay for this service. Kathy is not in any way involved with them as a, uh, an insurance company. And they are sending her letters telling her that she needs to stop doing what she's doing because somebody somewhere in their system has a standard that says, oh, that's not appropriate. What is their business getting involved? So we're protesting, and one way we're doing it is to share our story with you. Uh, we'll certainly be writing letters to them as well. And if you have similar experiences, write your own letters. Write letters to your insurance company and tell them how unhappy you are. The problem is that, that, that your employer is in the middle. Well, and, not, and that it's there not a are one or two major suppliers. You know, the, the insurance mm -hmm. companies of choice are becoming progressively more limited. Right, they're becoming behemoths. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, please, thank you for listening as yes, always. And please defend yourself, and hopefully your doctor will help. And I think that there is some hope in this situation if we all actually understand what the problem is. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. 
Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.